those of you who have your outlines, we know that we have been working our way through. And we are halfway through the first page, and we are about to chew through, hopefully, number three, the throne of God. We should get through it entirely today, but there's a lot, a whole lot there embedded in between. And, um, of course, the name of this is the book of Revelation. Go back to the first frame from me. The book of Revelation outline of the book of Revelation. We begin with the introduction that we covered, John identifying himself. We saw that. And that those elements from verses 1 to 3 of the first chapter are important that we look back on it because we will see revisited all of those things that he mentioned again and again. There are a lot of repeated terms and words in Revelation. Revelation has scores of lists of words that that appear more frequently in, in it than anywhere else. Of course, all these things are words surrounding uh, eternity, surrounding heaven itself. It's the most heavenly book of all books is because even the books such as Ezekiel and Isaiah, they, they just have a chapter or so dedicated to, to the realm of heaven when they have their, their encounters. But the whole book of Revelation is built on heaven. And it surrounds that. And so we saw the messages to the seven churches of Asia to get our attention and prepare our hearts as kind of a, a test also to prognosticate your position, your 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 life's course in the body of Christ. We saw the different churches and we considered them to be things that we need to check in our hearts. Are we doing what they did wrong or are we doing what they did right? We covered all seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Remember we saw that both Ephesus and Philadelphia had no criticisms. So those are special churches and uh, we covered the reasons why. More than likely it was because of a covenant of grace. They understood grace because they, you cannot conclude that they were sinless. Just they understood. They didn't allow certain things, in, such as Jezebel and those that call themselves apostles. Also, we see some of the church. These are all things that, that we need to uh, make sure that we stand our ground in our faith, and there's going to be a trial and it's going to be difficult. So now we come to the section on the throne of God, and this is a, an overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to see that John has an encounter before the throne of God. We're going to see that John witnesses 24 elders and four living creatures. And we're going to talk about the elders and we're going to talk about the creatures in detail. We're going to find that John finds that only the Lamb is worthy to take the judgment scroll from God and break the seals. And we're going to discuss why. Everybody yells out, worthy is the Lamb. But the question is, why is he worthy? And uh, the answer is, is forthcoming, but it, it's, it's not always understood. So we're going to cover that. And fourthly, we're going to see under the throne of God, the created beings in heaven give praise to God. And it says created beings because at that point, it is all of the elements that are there praising God and those that are present. But this is without, in fact, nothing. The throne of God is just, this is a picture, a scenario created from verse 1 of chapter 4 to verse 14 of chapter 5, it, it's setting a stage for an environment that will interact with the church. But the church is not there yet. In this whole, in this whole section, the church is not there. The redeemed are not there. We find the elders, but, but mostly none of the people that are part of the covenant with Jesus Christ are present. And so we'll discuss some of the reasons for that and why the stage had to be set. But so let's get into the throne of God. We begin seeing letter A. John has an encounter before the throne of God. And we read the passage from verse 1 of chapter 4. After this, this is John's meeting, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was, was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there 
had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Now I want to begin breaking this verse down, or these verses, by starting where it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the significance of this word door here, of course, it's a door into heaven, but the word door appears in seven scriptures that help us to understand more about the significance of doors in the Bible, and these are related to Jesus but also related to the passageways in and out from the Lord. But there's some other things I'm going to mention also. But number one, salvation is a door. We see in Matthew 7, 7, 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks or sees, he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And, and, and salvation is a door, but it's a door that we have to knock on. The Lord reveals to us from heaven. The Father reveals to the hearts of men, as Jesus said, flesh and blood does not do that. So the Father reveals the desire or the need to know the Father, God, and He reveals the Son to us through salvation. And I remember when I walked through this door of salvation, and I remember knocking on the door. Very often we didn't know we needed to knock on the door. Or we were knocking on the door in a way that we didn't think was knocking. We just thought we were wondering or we were uh, seeking maybe ourself or our life or, or trying to discover the meaning of life. Whatever it was, God, because He's put that inside of us, there's a desire in us to, to seek. There's a desire in us to ask and finally to knock on the door. And Jesus is that door. And Jesus says He stands at the door. And we're going to cover those scriptures too. But here, salvation is, is a door. And, and the door, we have to consider where John said in the first passage, we're, we're basing all this on, that John says he saw a door in heaven. There's always a door or a passageway between there and here. The whole book of Revelation is about there. But it will talk about here in relation to what happens here so that he can make the transition or the transformation or the metamorphosis of creation for it to exist there. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. That, that I got the big picture as I studied through the passage over the last few days that all of this is talking about and the stage is being set for a metamorphosis of creation. And where the verse says that, that all creation groans in earnest expectation because creation itself, uh, the, the base elements of this world, if we can anthropomorphize them and think that they're thinking and talking because the scriptures actually speak about the trees praising God and the rocks will cry out. So that means that some way, on some level, there's some resonating vibrations or something coming out of matter. And we're not going to get into the mystic ideas of the trees having souls and the, none of that craziness. But yes, creation itself was created to please God. And it cannot in its present form, there has to be a transformation of all matter, all things for us to really exalt the Lord. And that's what I got the picture of this whole thing is that, that the doorway is set because there's no other way to get there from here. But he is the door, but eventually even the door itself will be eradicated because there will no longer be there, but it will be here and here will be there. And that's good news for us because we will transition. Those of us who have the ability. Now, if we do not have the ability to transition, and that ability is given to us by the blood of Jesus, through the washing and the cleansing and then the reformation of our bodies, then we will have to be disposed of. And, and those, But everyone's going to be sucked into that other place. And uh, I, I, I was talking a little bit about black holes, and scientists don't understand how the black holes are and what they are. Uh, they know that light cannot escape them. But there are some of them, one of them they know to be the center of our known existence, our universe. There's a, they say there's a great black hole. They cannot define it. They cannot say what it is. But it, it, it's really pretty easy to think about. You think about a black hole. Light cannot escape a black hole. It literally gets sucked into it. The gravitational force of a black hole is so powerful that light, trying to travel away from it, cannot. It gets sucked back through it. And so you see blackness. In other words, in there, and I heard a scientist say, and I quote the scientist, not a believer, but a scientist talking about black holes pontificating as they do about all of his knowledge. 
He said, it seems that within this realm of blackness, there, there are no, there's no set parameters of time or space. That space, even distorted and perverted, cannot have any confines or measurements. In other words, it's not applicable, he said. Space and time have no meaning in these holes. Sounds like eternity to me. And when I think about a door between here and there, maybe these black holes are just that. Maybe those are the doors. I mean, we don't know. We cannot. We would not be able to perceive the passage of angelic beings that come in and out of those passageways to minister to us. But we know that His ministering spirits come to us. We know biblically they come in and out of heaven. In other words, they're passing through a door somewhere. Just a little conjecture for fun. <laughs> Black holes could be those portals. And we then, of course, according to the understanding of matter as we know it, if we were to get sucked into a black hole, we would be uh, dismembered, disintegrated, decimated into little tiny, tiny, tiny particles. It wouldn't even be decimated, it'd be like millimated. It'd be, <laughs> it'd be very, very teeny, tiny, little people. But we would just turn into powder because it's that black hole. The forces alone would just melt us. And unless we had some other being, some other type of body like the like the particles they're trying to measure with the, with the super colliders and all those things that seem to pass right through matter. And that, as I've talked about before, that would be a lot easier to go through this door. We also know that Jesus said that no one can come through the door except through Him. Because He is the doorway. In other words, it's the blood of Jesus that transforms us, gives us the right to be changed into a new form that can fit through the door. And no one else will be able to go through the door. This is thought. We see the second one. Doors are open for a moment. And, and these are the, the actual, everywhere the word door was used in the New Testament. This is what I'm piecing this together from. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out and meet him! And all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves, like we did. Basically. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Because doors are open for a moment, an opportunity of time. And the door that is the door into eternity, we know, is that way. And we do, the door that is Jesus, we know. It, it, for a moment in time, people will get a revelation to receive the Lord, but they can easily pass by that. And He wants everyone to be saved, so He throws the seeds of His kingdom and the Word of God out over everyone. But some people receive it on rocks, some people receive it on the, on the road, some people receive it amongst thorns and briars, and others finally on good ground. We need to pray for the Lord to prepare the hearts of men so that when we prepare the word of the seed to give to them that we'll find good ground people so we can see a fruit. But the fact is that that's only for a moment. I've seen people who were right for salvation and they passed it by. And now their hearts are hard and they're absolutely resistant to the gospel. Some of them dabbled in Christianity never truly gave their heart to the Lord, but thought about it and analyzed it and decided it wasn't for them. Well, that was a door that was open for a season, but then closed. Also for us, as we just went through the churches, we saw the danger of our names being blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. We saw the danger of those that, that do not endure to the end. And if we do give in, and so, yeah, the door is open, but it doesn't mean the door is going to be open forever. It is open for a season, and in that season we respond. Number four, we watch the door in expectant faith. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. 
You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. This is the doorman. That he watches the door for the coming of the master. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Watch what? He says it. The door. Tell the one at the door to keep watch. So we keep an eye on the door. And we know that Jesus is speaking here in Mark about himself and his return. And so that's the third thing I see here about this door. That we watch the door in expected faith. We look toward the door, the door that goes into heaven, the door that we also call the veil in the temple. When we worship, we are looking at the door. We're paying close attention to the passageway between heaven and earth. Reveal to me the, the passage to your throne as we sing even in that song, that I'm always conscious of the fact that there is a dividing line between us for now, but that I'm going to keep my eyes on that door and wait for the stirring of the Spirit of the Lord. And I watch. If I can see even that, that handle jiggle a little bit, I know my Master's trying to come in and I'm going to open it up as quickly as possible. I want to be receptive and open. And that includes everything that He does in my life. Number five. We open the door quickly when the Lord moves. Oh, I skipped number four. Okay, thank you, sir. Number, number four. We knock on the door persistently. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked. And my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because of his, he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. In other words, the man found a door that was closed. And, and the door was not being opened. And there were reasons why the door should not be opened. But we know that there's parables, many of them, that speak about the fact that just because the door is closed, it doesn't mean we should accept that it it's closed. That we, by persistence, can press in. Jesus with the Syrophoenician woman, with the Canaanite woman. Get away from me, woman. It's not right to give the children's bread to dogs. He was very harsh and mean. Gave her a no answer three times in a row. No, no, no! No, woman, get away from me. Even the disciples were dragging her physically away from Jesus, telling Jesus, would you shut this woman up? She's driving us crazy. That poor woman, if you think you have a hard time entering the presence of God sometimes, you think you have a hard time in your way with Christ, that woman was being tortured, but she didn't give up. She kept pressing in, and even in the most humiliating of circumstances, she humbled herself and said, even the little puppies eat the crumbs that fall from the master's people. And that melted the heart of Jesus. And the way the Lord showed me in a vision years ago is the Lord looked at her and smiled because when she said it, a gold gleam came over her face. And she shined. And Jesus pointed at her and said, that's faith. And, and turned to the disciples and said, look at that faith right there. Because faith is what pleases Him. Without it, it's impossible to it. And faith can be evidenced through persistence. And this goes for the opening of the door. I like what Smith Wiggins once said, the Spirit doesn't move. Move the Spirit! <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you can do that. You can reach into the realms of God and grab hold of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks you, sees you, finds to him who knows the door will be opened. This is the passage we're looking at earlier also but in a different um, gospel. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? 
It occurs to me to ask him again today. Holy Spirit, we want you. We need you. Father, give us the Holy Spirit. If my little Sarah Jane asked me for an egg, I'm not going to punish her with some cruel trick and give her some snake or a scorpion. If she asked me for a cool drink of water, I'm not going to put horse urine in a cup and trick her and give it to her. I'm going to give her the finest I can give her. How much more do you want to give us the Holy Spirit? Lord, we receive the Holy Spirit here today. We receive the Spirit of the Lord because that's what we insist on. That's what we are persistently knocking for. We knock and 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 say more of I need more, more of the Holy Spirit. I want more of the Holy Spirit. Let, let the Holy Spirit consume us. And this is the, this is demonstrating persistency. The door is already locked, and my children are back with me. Go away, pesky neighbor! Stop it! Wait for a service to get the Holy Spirit. Wait for one of those services where the preacher gets real preachy about the Holy Spirit. This is a class on Revelation. You shouldn't be pushing in for the Holy Spirit right now. <laughs> oh, yes, you should. All the time. All the time. Now we're to number five. We open the door quickly when the Lord moves. <laughs> Be dressed, ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding paper so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Immediately. It would be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. He's looking for people that are eager about his coming. He's looking for people that are hungry and are waiting and staring at the doorknob and waiting for the jiggling of the handle. And when he does move, if the quicker we respond, the more pleased he will be with us. Our attitude's being right. The day that you will dress himself to serve, we'll have them recline at the table and we'll come and wait on them. But you know the Lord wants to serve you? And if you respond quickly, he is so pleased with your response to his moving that he then decides, you know what, I'm going to give you a special treat today. You sit at the table for a change and I am going to dress myself as a servant and I'm going to wait on you and I'm going to take care of you. You recline at the table. That is the refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. That's the times of renewal and refreshing we get when we come into the glory of the Lord. We should be working as slaves for him only, but he, he likes to turn the tables every now and then. If we are quickly responding to him, then it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready. Even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night, what does that mean? When, when he comes at an inopportune time, when, when his spirit begins to tug on your heart at 3 a.m., you turn over and go back to sleep instead of rising to, to talk to him. <laughs> he likes that when you let him disturb your sleep when necessary. He does it to me a lot. He seems to choose those times because he knows I don't have anything else to do, so I'll give him my full attention. And it's quiet in the house, and the TV's not on, and, and I left my iPhone upstairs, and, and it's just me and him. And he's like, yeah, this is what I want. I just want me and you. Because he loves us that much, and he just wants that time. Intimacy. this. And I love you too, Jesus. I love you. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you did not expect him. Number six. Concerning the door, we see the door is narrow. Luke chapter 13. He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. 
Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. Remember that scripture, by the way, where it says that you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, because we're going to refer to that verse when we're in 24 elders in, in the throne. But you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. So the door is narrow because of all these reasons, because of what it requires, and the sacrifice, and some people's heads are too big to fit through the door. They're so swollen up with their own ideas and knowledge puffs up. And some people have too many degrees to fit through the door. Number seven. Revelation 3.20. We saw this passage as we were studying in the last few weeks. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It says that he stands at the door because the, the doorway, as I said, is the place between the two realms. And in all of these passages, everywhere the Greek word for door appears, and that's what we just covered really in, in relation to Jesus, is speaking about there and here and here and there and the way between. And... Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And He stands at the door. In other words, we find Him at the, 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 the preface or the, uh, the dividing line. It's open, but we go to Him. He doesn't come to us. That's what I'm trying to say. We go to Him. We press in. We make every effort to enter the narrow door because He stands at the door and He knocks. He's calling out to everybody. We need to have a hungry heart of seeking desire to be with him. Okay. Now we made it through part of the first verse of the fourth chapter. And we continue in that first verse. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet. And I'm going to talk about this voice. There are seven other passages in Revelation that use the word voice referring to Jesus. Now, first of all, the word voice appears a lot throughout the passage of Revelation, but mostly referred to the voice of angels and the voice of the uh, cherubim or seraphim speaking and, and the angel that's speaking to John. But where it speaks about Jesus is actually seven or eight passages total, seven other besides the one that we see. So we're going to look at them and get a full picture of, of what it means by saying the voice. The first one, number one, the voice is a call. Revelation 1.10 On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now, in this passage we just got finished reading where John speaks about the, the voice like a trumpet that he had heard. It's referring to this passage, of course. But he's saying that on the Lord's day when I was in the Spirit and it says in the and the Amplified wrapped up in the Spirit. Wrapped in the Spirit, which is a good place to be. I heard him behind me, a loud voice like a trumpet. And this is the call of God, the voice of the Lord comes. Trumpets were always used as an instrument to call people. That to get the attention of the masses with specific blowing patterns, we see this, not only do we see it in the Bible, we see it in all cultures that horns meant things. In, in American military, to this day, the horns are blown for certain things. One in the morning, to, to revel, they, they call it, to wake up the people. And then at night, they have the other horn blowing to make the people go to sleep. There's horns for battle in certain tones. It's how many how many tones are released and how much time and the way certain music and this was the cavalry even the horses knew in, in the sound of the horns horses would respond to the sound of the horns and they knew and so we see that throughout history and throughout the Bible the trumpet was designed to call 
And, and I think of that. When God speaks to us like a trumpet, it's because He's calling us, calling us to service, calling us to salvation, firstly, but also calling us to serve Him. And when we hear that voice, we see in the 12th verse, the first chapter, two verses after that, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. Because the voice redirects our focus and attention. Specifically says, I turned around. And it didn't have to say this, but if it's in the Bible, it's because God wanted us to see it and think about it. He could have just said, the Lord's out with the Spirit, I heard behind me a, a, a loud voice like a trumpet. We would have assumed that he turned around and did just keep his back to the Lord at the whole time of his conversation. But he, it says it because God wanted us to see that there's something in us that when God does call, we are required to change the direction. To turn around, if it was behind him, it would be a 180 degree turn. In other words, the opposite direction from where he was going. Because when the Lord does call, it's because you're going in the wrong direction usually. And he wants to get your attention. No, 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 no. no. Come back here. I call, my voice becomes like a trumpet in the shopping centers of Singapore when my little girl is going in the wrong direction. Sarah Jane! It gets like a trumpet. You hear it like a trumpet? And she knows it. And the people around me know it. Parents don't complain because they also have their own trumpets. And they know that trumpet sound when they hear it. You hear that had enough trumpet? You ever hear that one? The, the, the sound of parents had enough? And when it gets loud, and nobody thinks that's too loud, you need to keep quiet. Everybody knows that you blow that trumpet. Go ahead. <laughs> Correct that child. But this is what the Lord does with us. And so we turn around, we redirect. God often gets my attention. Right now. Number three, we see that word voice again. The voice is like rushing water. That's where it says there, his feet were like rods going to the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. I've been near very big waterfalls, and if you've never been to a, like Niagara Falls, if you go to Niagara Falls, but if you're within 200, 300 feet from Niagara Falls, you cannot talk to each other. If you've ever been by a real waterfall, either you can't hear people. It's just so loud, you have to yell with your hand cupped around the person's ear if you're within, like, from the wall back there, just so loud. It's like standing inside of a jet engine. And this is what it's talking about. Like rushing water. What a powerful voice. Ezekiel 43, 1 through 5. Then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing water. And the land was radiant with his glory. That was the light coming off of God himself, lit up the land. The vision I saw was like the vision I had seen when I when he came to destroy the city and like the visions I had seen by the Kabar River. And I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Whenever the voice manifests like rushing water, it has something to do with these patterns of, of God's presence moving to do something to it accomplish them. There's reference of his voice being like the voice of a multitude also. And we're not looking at the scripture right now, but if we consider that, that would sound like a lot. How did we ever imitate? If I told you imitate a waterfall, and I said imitate a crowd, you would make the same sound. You'd go, ah, ah, which sounds like a crowd of people cheering, or sounds like rushing water. I don't know if he's going to talk to us this all the time to us. He's going to have hard to have a conversation with Almighty God. How you doing? <laughs> hey, I wanted to ask you. <laughs> okay, okay. I get that point. <laughs> no, because he was articulate and very clearly heard and discerned by John and all the people that ever interacted. Number four, the voice requires a response. And we read this. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If he hears my voice, anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. The two worlds will become one. When his world and our world collide, time and eternity, he comes through the doorway, and we interact with him in spirit. And whoever, he knocks the door, anyone who hears the voice. There's no limitation. 
But it does require, however, a response. The voice calls, but he calls to a lot of people that don't respond. He calls to a lot of his children that often do not respond. Last night, I, I called my little girl, and she did not respond. She just stared at me. She dared challenge Dad. And she knew by the time my rear end was two inches off the seat that she was in big trouble. I swear, by the time I looked at locked eyes at her and told her she disobeyed me, by the time I was this high, no, she started screaming. Because then I went to the kitchen and I got the biggest wooden spoon I could find and come back and beat her. And she knew that was coming. And said, you always listen to Daddy. Do you understand? Always. It requires a response. And if the Lord speaks to us, He wants us to respond. Number five, it's five, six, and seven. There's these three more uses of the word voice. The voice gives instructions. That's where it's used in Revelation 10, 8. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And that's specific instructions given by the voice because we, we're seeing kind of progression here with with. The different ones, we saw, number one, that, that the voice will come, uh, and it's a call. Number two, the voice redirects our focus. Then we saw that the voice is like rushing water, which is its intensity. And then the voice requires a response. And number five, the voice gives instructions. Because the response is you turning around and giving your full attention to the Lord. Yes, you call, and then He will then give you instructions. And every time he ever comes and ever interacts with us, he gives specific instructions. He tells us what we need to do. And I, I said that before, I forgot, I think I was ministering here, where I said it, that God doesn't come just to say hi. He doesn't just show up and say hi. He comes with instructions, directions. And this is true. And if you hear the voice of the Lord, and sometimes you don't hear the voice. You can be in the presence of the Lord and not hear the voice. Sometimes you just don't hear anything, but then sometimes you just hear it. God's saying something so loud that you cannot even hear the teaching or the preaching anymore. And the preacher's preaching and he's saying something, but you're getting a whole different message. That's the voice of the Lord. He's speaking to you at that moment. Take notes. Write it down. Don't worry, you're not going to hurt the preacher's feelings if you have your own little private conversation with Almighty God while he's ministering. He's just happy to have brought you to the doorway where you can interact and hear the voice and then receive instructions from God. And, and the, He always does this. The voice invites us up. And 11, 12. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. But this is speaking later of the people on earth taken up to the Lord. But there are two places in Scripture where it says, uh, come up. And, and it's both times the Lord is saying, come up, because the voice invites us up. We set our affection on things above. We set our mind on the things above, not on the things that we look up. Onward and upward, not backward and downward. Onward and upward, we want to move, responding to the voice of the Lord. The voice sanctifies us. Revelation 18 Four. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. This is speaking of the mystery horror of Babylon in Revelation, which we will get to and talk about extensively in the future of this class. But this is just to illustrate when the word voice is used. These are all the times, by the way, we've exhausted the use of the word voice in connection with Jesus. And this is him saying, come because he calls us out. He's looking to sanctify us. And look at where now we see the second time where that same passage says, Come up there, but we see it here also in continuation in our version, Revelation 4. It said, Come up here. At once I was in the Spirit. There are two places in the Bible where the invite is given, come up here, and they both refer to a transition from this world to the eternal place of God. And once I was in the Spirit, it says, going up to God, whether in or out of the body, Paul was not sure, 
requires a transformation of the physical existence of man. We must be altered to go up and interact with God in this fashion. The present state of man cannot. Physically, your body will not be able to go. Paul was not sure whether he was in his body or out of his body when he was called, caught up and called up to the third heaven. Third heaven doesn't mean it. Oh, there's several heavens. Well, there, it's just a reference. They refer to the firm and the sky as heaven. They refer to the earth as a form of heaven. And so the third meant the supernatural realm. It just means eternity. And I can prove that by going to Greco-Roman studies about the use of the word heaven. And we did it in a class in the past. I don't know if anybody was here. But we talked about it. Third heaven means heaven or eternal dimension. And Paul didn't know. Was it in his body? Was it out of his body? And when we interact with the Lord, we interact with Him in a spiritual dimension and we have a connection by the Holy Spirit. But we are not physically going to heaven at that moment. We're tasting of it, but it says, this is what it says, partakers of the good word of God and of the powers of the world to come. So we're having a foretaste, just enough to make us want to invest in property there. And it makes it worth it. Now, at once I was in the Spirit. And we know that John, now for John to have gone where he went, there's nothing in the Scripture that says that he physically was taken to heaven, you understand. And on the island of Patmos, wherever he was lodged at the time, I'm pretty sure that all that was there was a snoring body when he had this whole revelation. Because the physical cannot exist there, but the spiritual can, and we are spirit. So there was a shell of a man left on earth while he went like the woman in our church in Mexico who was caught up to heaven and she got to actually fly through New Jerusalem and she saw the cities and the streets and the whole thing. And I always envy her for that. When she came back, see her, she told me what happened. She said her body, she fell over her bed and she laid on the bed and then she was taken out of herself. But she said, I went. She was confused about the point. She said, now I went. I said, you physically went. Well, I did, but I was on the bed. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I just, I, I fell on the bed, and then he took me up. He took your body up, and she looked so confused. And anybody I've ever talked to about these experiences, they're like, Paul, I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body. And, but I'm judging by all the scriptures and what I see, physically, you know, Spiritually, yes. You're taking up and so therefore I'm I'm waiting. If you ever that's why I see when people go out under the power and they're laying on the floor crying, that's why I tell people all the time, leave them alone. Don't touch those people. If they cannot get up under their own power, then leave them down there. Leave them down there. Just leave them there. And you see that happen all the time in churches. I did a meeting uh, one time the power of God hit this lady fell out of the power. Her husband came and slapped her in the face. Wake up, wake up, honey. Wake up, wake up. I'm like, would you leave her alone? And she was smiling. <laughs> As he was slapping her. Because it was just the body she was slapping around. The Lord called the Lord later she testified the fact the Lord took her spirit up from him. And I'll tell you what, if I'm in heaven and you slap me awake, <laughs> we're gonna have some words. When I come to, I'm going to be really mad at you if you interrupt my heavenly holiday. <laughs> As would you with me if I did the same thing to you. And so that's why we leave people down under the power of God. Because we don't know whether they're in heaven or not. Or what's going on. Or what the Lord is showing them. We had a long interlude at the end of the service on Sunday night. And um, sister, one of the sisters was sitting here and she was just, her husband had to come help her. She could barely walk and then had to help her home. And she wrote me later and told me about what happened. Very, very similar circumstance. And when I did that, there was this kind of strange music I did at the end of the um, meeting, which was more like just an instrumental um, lingering time. And, and I knew I was doing it by the Spirit. It was during that time that she had this interaction with the Lord in a supernatural way. And she was so grateful for it. She wrote a big long letter telling me all about it, how wonderful it was. And, but her physical body was just left in a pile down here. And I think most of us in this room, a lot of us have been in that position. So we know it's like when the Lord is doing it. And once I was in the spirit. Okay. 
We're going to take a break right here and then come back after. Take a break. Thank you for the delicious brownies and white chocolates and whatever you want to call them. The whiteies and the brownies. We have a desegregated church here. We mix blacks and whites together. <laughs> So we left off here. I will show you what must take place after this, he continues. <coughs> Revelation of the future events of our life is always the intent of a meeting with God's Spirit. And he desires to reveal to us the things he has for us. Because really those two dimensions we find throughout the book of Revelation, it is what he has for us and what's going to happen. So the reason he shows us what's going to happen is because bad things are going to happen. And the, the number one thing that Jesus warned his disciples about were bad things. He told them about the good things and what they would receive and, and uh, eternal life and all the benefits. But he said, beware, very commonly he'd say, beware of this, beware of that. They will do this to you. They're going to hand you over to the, to the magistrates and the leaders and they're going to persecute you and this and that. But don't worry, this is going to happen. That's, that is a common Form. And so Revelation, as in the book of Revelation, as well as all the prophecies, were about good and bad things. The bad things we must go through in order to get to the good results. And so all those that live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Because we have the benefit of living this life, but we're going to have to pay a price. There's going to be <coughs> trials and difficulties. And he wants to show us so that we'll be prepared for it. He doesn't want you to be caught unaware of what's coming. Betrayal is you expecting something and then being surprised. The element of surprise is the power of betrayal. But if, if you expect, according to the Scripture, if you study your Bible vehemently, constantly, then you'll know the patterns of the Scriptures and you'll know that there is no one good. So even betrayal can't surprise you because you know that you're going to be betrayed. But not by my father. Yeah, by your father, by your mother, by your husband, by your wife. Because we're human beings. Somewhere along the line, we're going to drop the ball and mess everything up. And if you accept that early on, and that's part of the reason why the Lord prepares you and tells you this is the way people are. And then you can learn to forgive before you're ever offended. And that way, your forgiveness is instantaneous. As soon as you are offended by someone, immediately you let them go. Because you knew, like, that's why that was the power of Jesus with Judas, while he could kiss him and call him friend. Because he knew he was going to do that. He already knew that thing you're going to do, do it quickly. I don't think Judas even understood that he was talking about the betrayal when he told him that thing he needed to do it quickly. Just like the other disciples thought it had something to do with the preparations for the feasts and all that they were doing, or maybe money for the poor or whatever. I think Judas thought, maybe Jesus thought the same thing. But Jesus knew what he was doing. Because he had just whispered in the ear of one of the disciples, the one that dips in the sock with me is the same one that will betray me. Hey, Judas, how and it was to expose to the others because also Jesus exposes to us the things of other people so that we not ally ourselves with those that are corrupt. But we see this pattern repeat. I will show you what must take place after this. Hope is built on what we will receive from God in the future. The whole system of faith is built upon this principle. The substance of things hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, but the substance of things hoped for, what you hope for, is substantial to you as a believer. And without living that pattern, you cannot please God. And that's why faith is necessary. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. You have to have the substance of what you're hoping for. The hope of tomorrow is your strength of today for believers. For all people, for that matter, everybody's making plans in hopes of a better tomorrow. And as they do that, there's nobody out there making plans of, in hopes of a worse tomorrow. I'm making, I'm strategizing so that I, buy, I have this five-year plan, and at the end of five years, I will have lost everything. <laughs> little by little, I'm, I'm positioning myself to where I will be cheated and, and stolen from and lied to, and, and eventually... My ultimate goal is to be left in squalor, in disease, in heartache, and abandoned on the side of the road, and, and so I'm strategic. No, nobody's doing that. 
You can have that if you want. Just you know, give up on life. It'll happen to you naturally. But 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 we hope we have the substance of things so far. We are motivated today about what's coming and how. And, and it's good if you have an exercise program that you get a poster or a picture of what you want to look like and put that thing up and look at it. And, and <laughs> you know, the, the beginning of one of my strongest exercise regimes that I've ever done started right after I saw the movie 300. <laughs> what guy doesn't see that movie and think? <laughs> Especially if you were your girlfriend, you know, or your wife, you're like... Oh, what was I watching some movie? Oh yeah, Fast Five. I was watching Fast Five and The Rock. That guy's like a, he's like a god. You know, he's like, he's beautiful. He's just beautiful. He's perfect. And he's bigger in this movie. Like, he got bigger. Why would he do that? <laughs> he was big enough. <laughs> now he's bigger and more beautiful. <laughs> we were in the house, and uh, one of the, well, uh, it'll give away who stayed in my house with me, Johanna. So, anyway, she was in the house, and that movie was on. We had a, 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 a trailer of it. And The Rock came on the screen, and she was in a position where she couldn't see the screen well because she was cleaning up the table. When she saw The Rock, she moved her, she knocked over a glass. <laughs> and I said, you okay? I just like The Rock, she said. <laughs> but anyway, back to the subject. The substance of things, hopefully you can want to, to do a thing or achieve a thing about you or your, you know, you see that in all these, even for the women, it's the slimming programs and they show you the model with the little tiny waist and this is what she used to look like and this is what she looks like now and if you buy this package and plan, you can do that. They're using your hope of things as a way of making money off of you, but they're operating on your faith. Because that's all it is. And the Lord shows you what must take place so that you will know. And this is certainly true of what we're covering. And what we're looking at here in this passage. Because look at the very next verse. Or part of the verse as it goes into the second verse. And there before me was a throne in heaven. With someone sitting on it. The word throne appears 38 times in Revelation. More than any other book in the Bible... And more, in fact, it, is sh it shows up as much in Revelation as it does combined throughout most of the rest of the Bible. And so you can say that the, the, the book of Revelation is a book of thrones. Because there's his throne, which shows up frequently, but also the thrones of the elders that they're sitting on. And there before me was a throne. Now, using the definite article here, this a throne is the throne. Uh, the indefinite article, a throne, meaning one. And of course, we're talking about the throne of God. And so, the passage continues there in verse 3. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald, and circled the throne. You understand that? It wasn't like a rainbow going over the throne, it says encircled. This rainbow was surrounding like a ring around the throne. And so this is the, actually the aura that was around God. His radiance showed up as a rainbow resembling an emerald. A brief description of the one on the throne speaks of his beauty. This verse tells us that the one who sat on the throne appeared like Jasper and Carnelian or Sardius is another name for that stone. The Carnelian was a red stone and the Jasper may have been a clear stone but some think it was more opaque or like the color of a, a golden color. No doubt these gems represent the beauty and majesty of God. In Exodus 28, 17-21, we see these stones mentioned and they represent the 12 tribes. I'm not going to actually go to that passage, but they represent the 12 tribes of Israel which were embedded in the breastplate of the high priest. The carnelian was the first stone in order and the jasper was the last stone. The implication is God's, and, and, is God's throne room is open to all from the first to the last, and we think of him as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. His 
two stones mentioned are the first of the first tribe and the last from the last tribe of the twelve embedded on the breast piece. I thought that was interesting to know. A lot of symbolism can be found. We go to the next frame. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. The rainbow is the symbol of covenant with God. His promise to not destroy man with flood. Remember, that's what we see rainbow in the Bible. The rainbow, the origin of the rainbow was a covenant with God. This colorful aura around the throne can be the hue of glory and majesty. If we could see the glory of God in a place, I consider that it would be beautiful and colorful. And when we are actually there with Him and see Him in person, there's going to be this, this circular pattern of rainbow color around Him. And I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be really cool to look at. It's going to be beautiful. But I'm just, these are all the details. We're creating an image is what we're doing of what John is seeing. We know John spoke to the Lord appearing, but at the, in the first chapters, 1 through 3, there's no reference to the atmosphere so much as it is Jesus Himself in His glorified form. But now, if you will, John is stepping back to see where is He at. And His throne is there. This is His place. Now he's, we're gonna, these, these circles are going outward. We've started at the center, which by the way, that's where we're supposed to start, at the center with Jesus. Everything is centered on Jesus. But now outside of Jesus, we find uh, this other path. This is a doctrine I call the doctrine of um, centricism, which everything that is involving God is in the center. And He is the center of all things. And we know that the Scriptures say this, but we see this in all heavenly manifestations and earthly representations of heavenly things. Every camp, every temple, everything that is positioned, that you will find... The element of it on earth that represents God is found exactly in the center of it. Like you may have heard me refer to the Holy of Holies before. We know that there's the, the holy place and then there's the Holy of Holies. Well, the holy, the tent in the center was in the middle of the court. And then in there, the Holy of Holies was a perfect cube-shaped room. And in the very center of that room, that is exactly halfway up to the height of it, and exactly halfway in between the two walls, in the exact middle, and in the middle from the, from the back to the front, in the exact center, if you were to draw string lines down to find the exact center of the Holy of Holies, was the very spot by measurement which was the top of the mercy seat of the, of the Ark of the Covenant. And that means that the presence of the Lord came down and made contact and came to a point on the top of the mercy seat. That's why the blood was sprinkled there. And it says, and the priest heard the voice of the Lord coming from on top of the mercy seat. So his voice was emitting from that exact center of the Holy of Holies. Because God will always come to the center. And so also outside of the temple, when you get to the Israelites, they had the tent set up in the meeting, and then around them were circles of the encampment of the people around, which we're going to see represented also here in heaven, that the, that the tribes were lined up around him, and he was the center. Wherever he was, he was dwelling with his people. His people were dwelling with him, even in a tent like that as they traveled through the wilderness. And so also we see the same thing in heaven. By the way, the, the holy city, New Jerusalem, is also a perfect cube. And the Bible says that in the very exact center of that is the throne of God. So God will dwell. There's no temple in it because God is the temple and He is the center of it. His light and radiance comes right from the middle of that holy, holy cube. New Jerusalem, our home, forever where, where we are going to live. And, and it's going to be beautiful. So here he is seeing the throne itself. But now we're going to go to the next frame after John is encountered before the throne of God. He sees the throne. But now let's move outward from the throne, which is, I said, the center. Now John witnesses 24 elders and four living creatures praising God from verses 4 to verse 11. And we read where it says, Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And surrounding the word means in a circular pattern around that. 
So you see the throne, you see the one sitting on the throne, and then directly around him is the aura of his presence or the rainbow that is there. And then the next ring outward, the very next thing to him are these 24 thrones that are built around his throne. And seated on them were 24 elders. And they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. It was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. And notice the, the repeat of the eternal concept of Him. It always comes back to that. His eternality. Who was and is and is to come. And ever and ever, who lives forever and ever, him who lives forever and ever. They, they tag that on throughout the book of Revelation because it's a book speaking about the eternal one. They all give reverence to him because he's eternal. None of them are eternal. There are no other existing beings, not these creatures, not these elders, not anything else is eternal except for him. You understand? Because he's made everything. That means everything has an origin or a beginning except for him. He just is and has always been. The verse continues, they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. And you know that can only be said of an eternal God. Now what John witnesses here is the clearest description of the atmosphere around the throne of God we find in the Bible. There's other mentions throughout the Bible about the throne room, but they're vague. These, this is detailed. This is the, a detailed report of exactly what you, you could you could draw a diagram pretty easily. And I've seen a lot of artists renditions and pictures of they try to capture this but I'm, all of them look like a foolish joke to me I've never seen any any artwork capture I just I feel insulted when I see I don't care if it's the Sistine Chapel none of it when I look at it because I know God and when I see it and I see they're trying to project it I know that that is so far from there's no way that even hold a candle to the reality. And so, I mean, hats off for them trying to capture this, and this is be the passage that you would want to use if you're trying to paint a picture, but the best you're going to come up with is, is kind of a joke compared to what it's actually going to be like to stand there in that time and, and see it. And there's a lot of elements to consider here that, that were just broken down in those verses. We must try our best to envision this glorious place. Remember, you will see it. You will be there physically. You and I will endure to the end in Jesus' name. And we will make it. We will fulfill the will of the Father. We will please Him. We will have our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they will remain there, not be blotted out. Which means that we will be able to go and stand and see that place. It's kind of like when you hear of some new new place in Singapore being made or a new shopping center and there's a lot of hubbub about it and they say this and say that and you've had all these ideas but then you actually go see it. How many of you have been to Universal? 
Universal Studios here. Okay, you know, you heard a lot about it before, but then when you actually go, when you're in there, you're like, oh, cool, this is Universal. They said that, and you look around and you experience, it's going to be, we are, just as we went to Universal, after hearing a lot about it, even through the years of preparation and when they voted and decided whether they would even allow it, or remember, going back in time, I've always been excited about the idea of it. And if that was thrilling to finally walk through that gate and see Universal, how much more will it be when we finally walk through this gate and stand in this atmosphere and, and reach out and want to touch the rainbow and, and see what it feels like to stick our hand into the rainbow around God? Shoo! It's going to be great. I can't wait. I'm going to check the thrones out. His throne, of course, but I want to see the elders' thrones too. I want to see everything. I want to see what they look like. And I'm sure it's going to be beautiful. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. And they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, who are the 24 elders? Did you ever think about this? Who are these people? Just random selectees from the earth? No, there are, there are, there are, there are different theories, but I'm going to kind of give you one of the theories that I like best. And one theory is that they are the lineage of God's chosen people. The reason I choose this is because there is more biblical evidence of this than anything else. Luke chapter 3, verses 34 and 38, we take out the portion of the lineage listed by Luke, which is the line coming from God all the way to, to Joseph, who was the father of Jesus, who was on earthly terms, but that is the lineage through which the line of the tribe of Judah would finally come and exist on earth, the captain of the host. And so Jesus said, he's not... God of the dead, but God of the living. He's the God of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, but he said it the other way around because we're going backwards here in the list. So he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? He referred to himself as that. Because the covenant stood and was fulfilled with the patriarchs that led up to that moment. And the Bible is completely written in surrounding these people. And, and we see, if we, if we look at it from the bottom... The, the Son of God, meaning Adam, was the Son of God because Adam was made by God. And he was the first Adam because Jesus was referred to as the second Adam. But Adam was the Son of God. And then from Adam came Seth, Enosh, Canaan. Was the, this is grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. On down the line we see the lineage. And you know when you see these names, you know their stories. Some of them have a lot more detail surrounding them. Some with less detail. Nonetheless, these are people who were important enough for the Bible to use their lives as the skeletal system of the story. And so the focus of God's kingdom as written in the Word of God is on these people's lives. These are the elders of Israel. All of the truth and things they understand are built on these people's lives. And it's note, noted that up from God all the way to Jacob, for the fulfillment of the covenant, which is what Jesus refers to, that we can count. And, and we know that God has His own throne, so we don't count God, but we put Abel in His place because Abel, uh, if we put Abel between Adam and Seth, because we know that Abel was killed, but it's not in the list because he was not able to have children, but children, if he were included, then that would make exactly 24 elders. So we see it in a list. One to 24, if you go chronologically, you would go from behind. This is the best biblical explanation of who the 24 elders are, to me. Now, you could conclude many things. You could say, well, maybe that they are just special people through time that God has chosen to fill those 24 thrones, and maybe we don't even know them. That's very possible. But going by the Word of God and what the Bible focuses on, it focuses on the lives of these people as the structure that built and brought all the way up to the lineage of Christ. So it's a good chance that those are the 24 elders. Then we go to verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, 
and peals of thunder. Now when we consider the amount of power that God is and has, it's no wonder that this would be. That, you know, we know, we see this, by the way, mentioned in a number of places. We see it in Isaiah when he went to him. And we see it very often that, that his, his, his motion would cause smoke to just pour out from under his throne, the glory of God. Because there's so much energy in God. God is light, the Bible says. And we know that light, like we consider plasma, uh, uh, the, the lightning that comes down when it strikes is pure energy and, and thunderstorms produce more power than anything man witnesses on earth. One storm produces enough electricity to run a city for years. One little thunderstorm that comes through, crack, crack, crack. There's, if you could somehow take all the power represented in that storm, you could run Singapore for years just on that electricity. So there's an amazing manifestation of power. So therefore on the throne also, that's the very thing that emits, it's coming out of the throne. So when we do go there and you do stand there and do stick your hand in the rainbow, don't be surprised that as you're doing it, if a lightning bolt fly past you. Don't worry, you have a glorified body. Can't hurt you. You're going to be able to play with lightning. You'd be able to stick your hand into a lightning arc. That'd be cool. See it. And you're going to hear the thunder and the lightning striking and the rumblings and we know from Isaiah and Ezekiel, smoke, and, and um, it's going to be a really amazing sight to see. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Now remember that the churches are referred to as what? Lamp stands. And here we see the spirits of God are lamps. So I conclude this. We, the churches of God, are the stands that hold the lamps. We're a platform for the manifestation of God's glory on earth. We are the focal point of meeting between heaven and earth where men can find the doorway into eternity. Jesus. So we as churches that sit here like the lamp stand. We're not the lamp itself, but we have this treasure in earth and vessels. So within the infrastructure and the administration of our churches when we gather together to agree in His name, He's there in the midst. The glory of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord comes and, and dwells on us like that lamp. The light that shines from us is the light of Jesus. So we simply stand as a lamp stand. May our church be a lamp stand for the Spirit of the Lord. And the seven lamps were blazing. That's exactly what I want the Holy Spirit to do in our midst. I want it to blaze. I don't want the Holy Spirit to twinkle in our midst. I don't want a spark. And the Spirit's been sparking in their church. No, I don't want spark. I want blazing. I want blazing. And we have seen blazes, and we're going to see greater blazes. And we're going to have great and wonderful encounters with real God. Also, before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass. Clear as crystal. Now, sea of glass, the specific term occurs three times in Revelation. Revelation 4, 6, is the passage we just read. And then Revelation 15, 2, it appears twice there. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And then that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now there's some significance when we consider this. The Greek word qualinos, translated glass, is an adjective descriptive of the sea, meaning that the sea was translucent like glass. The word translated crystal, crustalos, is derived from kruos, frost, like ice, and is perhaps intended to indicate as clear as ice. And so we see that like transparent golden streets, we see a lot of things in heaven are made and they are transparent. My friend, Chelo, who, who was taken up in the spirit and saw New Jerusalem, she said everything is transparent. And I can't even give you verses to back up that. But she said when she went, she said you could see through all the buildings and you could see through everything. Everything was transparent. And it would make sense because if the glory of the Lord is in the center and you don't need a lamp or a light or moon or sun, then you would want to let your windows be everything. Because you would want as much light of the Lamb shining into your little dwelling place as you could get. Wouldn't you want your all your... You would not close curtains. 
you want to get as much of that <laughs> as possible. So just make my house glass so that it just comes right through. And she confirmed that. She said she saw it. And she said, and you could see, she said, you could see through all the bills. She said, even in the streets, and she had not even read the Bible. Didn't even know these passages. She said, because she was just saved, just a few weeks saved when the Lord took her and showed her. And she said, even the streets, you could see through the streets. Can you believe that? I said, yes, I can. <laughs> I was mad at her because I didn't get to see her. I really did. I had a lot. I had a hard time. I wrestled with that for like six months of my life. <laughs> and mad. Why would God take this three-week-old Christian woman who sells bread off the top of her head, literally, she puts a basket of bread on her head, goes around and sets all she ever did, and, and, you, and here I am, a pastor, working for years, very hard. And I'm glad for her, but I interviewed her for countless hours. I, <laughs> look, if I didn't get here, you're going to tell me every day. <laughs> and she said you could see through the walls, you could see through the buildings, you could see everything. And, and, and in the center was just this, just light, just light, but she knew. And she just knew. She said, I know this. She said, I will live there forever. That's what she said she knew. She said, I know I'll live there forever. And, and the sea now that we see there, the word thalassa, translated sea, is used 22 times in Revelation, mostly, but not always, symbolically. Speaking of sin, but there is actually speaks of seas also. The sea upon which Jesus reigns is connected biblically to the wickedness of men. And the reason is, like it says in Isaiah 57, 20, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Think of this, Matthew chapter 14, where it says, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went onto them walking on the sea. I, I, I think also that every time Jesus is related to a sea in the scriptures, he's conquering it. He calmed the sea and it amazed them. He walked on the sea. That is the ultimate. You know you conquered something when you're walking on it. If James and I got in a fight and he beat me unconscious and walked on top of me, you would know he won the fight. If I let him walk all over me. Well, this, this is what Jesus was trying to say. That the sea he had absolute control over. And his very throne is established on a sea of swords in heaven. And I see this analogy pretty clearly to me that Jesus walked on the sea, perhaps the disciples conquering the wickedness of us all. And now he reigns over the sea and it is calm. Remember, he calmed the sea, and in fact, the sea, this is why that verse talked about the sea, where that the redeemed will stand upon it also. Meaning that the, the things of our turbulent past and all the sin are washed away and are gone forever. It continues. In the center. Around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings, day and night. They never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is is to come. And the question is, what are these creatures? You notice it says there that they had six wings. I studied extensively through the Bible. Isaiah and Ezekiel both mention this exact scenario in heaven. And Isaiah says that these creatures had six wings also. However, Ezekiel says they had four wings. And we don't know exactly why. Some go far enough to argue that Ezekiel saw something a little different. That's really kind of a stretch. And some will differentiate even the difference of the dividing line between seraphim and cherubim by saying that the seraphim were those <clears throat> seen in one passage, but cherubim were in the other passage. I, I think they're talking about the same thing. So in, in attempts to answer the question, what are these, to understand the meaning of these symbols, we need to go back to the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 1. We have a description of four living creatures. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning, and surrounded by brilliant light, the center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures in appearance like 
their, their appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. See, that's what he says, four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. What that means is that they just hovered like, like that. They didn't, they didn't turn to navigate. They just, like if you saw something floating, you would know it floats like that. Because it just, so it was buoyant or floating in the air. And I think all this stuff sounds strange. We're told that on the right side, they had the face of a man, right? And the face of a lion. On the left side, they had the face of an ox and the face of an eagle. Ezekiel 1.10, their faces looked it says their faces looked like this. Each one had the face of a human being, and on the right side, each had the face of a lion, and the left face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Uh, they, these are identical symbols of the living creatures in Revelation 4 that we're looking at. So the detail is exactly the same, except for that one variation of six wings versus four wings. As in Revelation, so in Ezekiel, there was by them the likeness of a throne. Now, I'm going to conjecture a little bit about the four-wing and six-wing discrepancy. We're not going to go into details about it. But we do find that, that John was taken to see it. Isaiah was taken to see it. They both saw six wings. Ezekiel saw it come to him. And so for whatever reason... Heaven came down to him to show him, or at least the throne room came down. Maybe not heaven, maybe the throne room itself is movable, and that these creatures somehow are the conveyance of it. And maybe when they are in that form of bringing it down to an earthly dimension, they only need four wings. I don't know, I'm just guessing. <laughs> but I'm not really trying to figure out, I don't know why there's four or six foot. It still doesn't, doesn't take away from the glory of the fact that God's revealing himself. Ezekiel 126, above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. And we see that the description in Ezekiel, of, and you can go back and read it, in both visions of the glory of the Lord is manifested. Ezekiel 128, in both cases there's a rainbow about the throne. These angelic creatures in Ezekiel were cherubims, they were called in Ezekiel. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. There it is again. It's exactly what was described in. So they're seeing the same thing. There are some who say that the creatures in Revelation are not cherubim, but are unique and distinct. The uniformity of descriptions in Ezekiel and Revelation seem to tell us that the creatures are cherubim. Whatever the case, they're designed by God to exalt and glorify the Almighty. And I don't, I don't really have a, a lot of arguments about what is what and who is who, or if, if they're seraphim or cherubim. They, we know that they are not standard angels because standard angels do not have wings. But they have wings and they're operating in a heavenly dimension whereas angels interact with us here on earth. And, and someone in this room could be an angel and we wouldn't know it because they look just like... And Stephen Young just laughed, so maybe he. <laughs> we discovered you! <laughs> but it's because it says some entertain angels unaware of the fact that they're entertaining angels, which means they come and allow us to entertain them. And I always get this vision of me tap dancing for an angel. <laughs> Give a little dance or a jig or something, entertaining them. Sitting down, popping them popcorn, showing a movie. Entertaining an angel. <laughs> Play the keyboard We see symbolism here. The first beast was like a lion, the second was like a cat, the third was like the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Now, it's interesting to note this correlation. We see the four Gospels in symbol here because they're likened to this. While John could only describe the beasts by comparison, he is very precise in telling what they do. And they rest not night and day, he said, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was, is, which was, and is, and is to come. But now, as we look on, we see that 
the lion, in describing the four living creatures, John says that the first beast was like a lion. A lion is the king of the beasts and represents majesty. Thus, Christ is portrayed in the Gospel of Matthew as the king of kings. The main theme of Matthew is the kingship, the sovereign rule of Jesus. And that theme reoccurs through the whole thing, which is like the lion being the king. And remember, he was referred to as a lion of the tribe of Judah to establish his supremacy or his, his sovereignty as a ruler or as king. And, and also, the, take note of the words, like a. It says like a. It's not saying it was a lion, it was a calf, or, or it was like it. It was resembling it in some way, which in symbology could be that it bore the image of or had some type of a surface on it that looked that way. Calf, the second living creature, is, is said to be like a calf. The word translated calf can also be translated as bullock or heifer. This, of course, was an animal frequently used for sacrifice related to the ox. Like we see, it says that there was an ox also. Christ here is portrayed as sacrifice for our sins. Mark, in his gospel, represents Christ as the servant who was to be sacrificed. So one of the, one of the prevalent themes throughout the book of Mark is the sacrifice that Jesus made. Then we see man. The third living creature had a face as a man. So the third creature would represent Christ as a man. So also the Gospel of Luke represents Christ as the perfect man. Also as described in Philippians 2, Christ left his position of glory with the Father and became a man so that he might die on the cross for our sin. And finally the eagle, the fourth living creature, was like a flying eagle. The eagle symbolizes sovereignty and supremacy. Also thus the living creature represents Christ in all his deity. The Apostle John in his gospel re re represents Jesus Christ as the Son of God and shows his relationship with heaven. Now I want to talk about this fact that these four living creatures do not rest day or night as they protect the throne of God in its holiness. In other words, by making the announcement night and day, holy, holy, holy. In the Old Testament, we read something very much similar to Revelation 4. When Israel was camping in the wilderness, there were special precautions taken with the tabernacle which was the habitation of God in their midst. You know how serious the holiness of the tabernacle was. So much so that if anybody violated the rules and regulations, they would be put to death. If anyone dare even make the anointing oil from the same recipe, they had to be put to death. And they, or thrown out of the camp and never accepted. Absolutely rejected. So there was a lot of rules to protect that. The tabernacle was always in the center of the camp and was surrounded by 12 tribes. And we notice that Ephraim, Dan, Reuben, and Judah were the heads of these divisions of tribes in each section. So there were four divisions of three tribes in each division, and they were arrayed around throne and they had flags or standards one of an ox one of an eagle one of a man one of a lion mm. <laughs> so on the east side was Judah which had a banner of a lion Ephraim was on the west with the standard of an ox Reuben was on the south with the standard of a man and Dan was on the north with the standard of an eagle and we're just looking at some of the different symbologies that are laying here. We just want to try to get through the description. In the next Revelation 4, we continue. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. I, I kind of thought about this when I was studying it, that if you were one of these elders, you waited for the instructions of the, of the, of the creatures... To, to make the announcement now. So what were you doing in between then? Were they taking care of paperwork or talking or checking your email or what? And all of a sudden, you'd hear these things crank up again. Rolling! you just, boom, go down on your face. How frequently? I don't know. What if it was like top of every minute? You know, the, you know you're just constantly going, and I'm sure you would enjoy doing it. 
These creatures are indicators to the elders when it is time to fall down before the throne and worship Jesus. In other words, they're like worship leaders. They're the ones in place to lead the heavenly host. And by the way, they're also the indicators to the myriads of angels and also the indicators to the redeemed we'll see later on. So these beings that are there, which are surrounding the throne in the member in the rings, they're closer to him than the elders are. So closer than any human being are these so that when we look at the Lamb of God on the throne, when we look at the throne of God, we are forced to see the creatures there. And so we look at them and they indicate the time for obeisance to be made. And how they exactly do that, I don't know. Is it just they just start emitting the sound of worship? Or they just start screaming holy? Or whatever the case, when it happens, we know, bow down. And we see them 13 times in Revelation always in their position at the throne, functioning in one of three different basic actions. Speaking, standing, worshiping. And all 13 uses they're doing one of those two. They're either saying something or they're standing guard there around the throne or they are actually worshiping and leading everyone else in worship. So, it says, they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Now, in these verses, we see the basic essence of the reason for worship. We know that we worship because He's worthy. But why is He worthy? He's worthy because He is the source of all things. And if you go back to this fact that everything comes from Him and is sustained by Him, in Him we live and move and have our being, we must acknowledge that fact. All will inevitably confess this. The question is when and where. Salvation lies in the balance of the difference. Every created being is going to be forced to acknowledge this. But if you do it here on earth, you have salvation. And you go to heaven forever. If, if you wait till you have to get there to do it, well then you have the lake of fire and eternal suffering. But we do it here on earth. We acknowledge this. And why is He worthy? And this answers the question. Because he, everything comes from Him. And as I said before, there is no other eternal being. He doesn't have a bunch of eternal brothers that you know. That there's God and then there's these other ones. They were all, no, 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 no. There's no gods. There's God. And around him are things he created. We don't know how long before our existence he created those worshiping beings. We don't know how long before our existence the angels were made. We know that his angels are ministering spirits to us. So maybe they were built and made specifically to, to deal with us and to be for our service. Uh, but as far as the, the seraphim or cherubim that surround his throne, we don't have a chronology of events of the creative schedule of God. We don't know how long. It could have been billions and billions of years that they existed. But he made them, he put them there, and, and, and all for his glory, and he's the only one that's worthy. We're coming to... And then, in fact, we're, we're going to stop here and pray because we, uh, there's, yeah, there's quite a few frames there. I think I'm going to lead into the next time we come here.